for the remem remembrances. Funny, I went to school here, and so I haven't been up here in, since I was about seventh grade. Uh, I'm going to start by reading a letter that Jun in Tokyo has written to Mr. Professor. <laughs> Dear Dick, I regretted so many times not going to see you these four years. Of course, on the surface, it was COVID-19 that prevented me from visiting the US. I was so anxious about bringing a virus from Japan with me. But the biggest reason I didn't dare to visit you was that I didn't know how I could see you as you grieved over the loss of May. I regret this now even more, that I will not be able to see you anymore in this life, nor talk about you, nor talk with you about May's memory. Now it is both of your memories that I hold. Meeting you in May, when I was a very young age, and having you look out for me all these years later was a major asset to me in my life. You and May were my friends, my family, and my mentors. Whenever you visited Japan, we had the chance to see and talk to each other. Do you know how much I loved that time with you? I know all the Yasuba family feels this like I do. You even brought wonderful friends to Japan whom I could not have met without you. And now your nephew Kurt will be, will be visiting Tokyo to bring your ashes to be with the Yasuba family. I am grateful for this goen that we had each other. I don't know how to translate goen. All the dictionaries I've referred to don't get it fully correct. Chance, fate, Destiny, not quite. Interweaving or entwinement, closer. We had a serendipitous bond. It was a relationship that appeared to have been formed by happenstance, but so much conspired to make it happen. And I would not, and I would not be me without having had you. I remember May liked Lord Goen, and we talked about it together. All the Yasuba family and I will be waiting to see you both with Kurt in the very near future. Love, Jun. Switching voice now to my own. There are countless memories I could share right now. Summer dinners outside, crawling in their garden with Rebecca, making a fort under their holly tree hearing the one sound that bled through our home's shared party wall, Mrs. Professor's piano playing. The low down drawer in their kitchen that was mine, filled with toddler toys and games. The undergrad graduation trip they took me on to Japan and our Christmas together in Tokyo to celebrate their 60th wedding anniversary. In fact, I always had two Christmases growing up. Christmas and Professor Christmas. On the designated day, my parents and I would wait until we heard carols through the wall, and then we would know it was time to walk over, carrying our bag of wrapped gifts, ready to sing. To this day, when I see a piano, I blink and see for a moment Mrs. Professor's ghost playing it. It is a happy moment. I think of them every day, sometimes in the silliest ways. A friend's child just threw up in the back seat of my car. I might have been mad, but I've been told that as a toddler, I napped on and peed all over the professor's brand new couch. So sorry to those of you who ever sat on their couch. Um, so what leg did I have to stand on? Their lives are knit into mine in inextricable ways. When my mom called me on a Monday night to let me know that Mrs. Professor's latest illness was fatal, one of the first things I remember, I remember saying into the phone was, Mr. Professor is going to die too. I couldn't imagine them without each other. That he lived several long years without her was a surprise to me, a gift to us, and I think evidence of how deep their love was. 
because the premise of the sentence is flawed. He was not living without her. I was right, he couldn't. And so he didn't. He kept her with him in every conversation, in every waking and dreaming thought. When I was with him, I always had the feeling that she was right down the hallway, right through a door, that she might enter at any moment to playfully surprise us. When Mrs. Professor died, Mr. Professor didn't, and by living, he kept her alive for several long years more. In the, one -on in the last one-on-one -on -one conversation I had with Mrs. Professor before her death, I told her that I was trying to get pregnant and that if I had a daughter, I would name her Ruthie May. Nine months later, almost to the day, my daughter Ruthie died and was born. One of the few comforts I had was knowing that wherever my Ruthie had gone to, her grand Mrs. Professor was there too. In one of my last conversations with Mr. Professor, he told me that he was worried about Ruthie. I know he meant he was worried about Reuben, Ruthie's little brother who is thriving, but the slip was telling. He no longer has to be worried about either of my children. He is with one and looking over the other. Stumbling on his newfound feet to daycare each morning, Reuben carries a small Tim Care Bears lunchbox, an homage to the hymn of the semi-detached house that the professors in Unkovic shared for 40 years. The hymn began, we are the Care Bears, we really care. If you ever want to play with us, you know that we'll be there. The rumor is that our hymn was adopted following a long car ride in the early 80s during which I screamed if it wasn't played repeatedly on my little tape deck, but I certainly don't recall that. Regardless, we sang it out loud in public many times over the years, the five of us together, at weekend dinners at the Elbow Room over games of hangman drawn with crayons on the paper tablecloths, in small Tokyo sushi joints, or at the PGC Grill in front of bewildered squash players. This, too, is my son's inheritance. My father always introduced the professors as my second set of parents, which is true, they were. But more than that, they were our neighbors. I don't say that dismissively. They were the embodiment of what neighbors should be in a functioning society. Mrs. Professor especially was horrified by the trajectory of global politics in the years just before she passed. I don't imagine I'm overstepping when I say it's a horror many of us share. But I think I know the solution, even if she didn't consciously. And the solution is something that she and Mr. Professor were experts at and teachers of, more than Japanese history, <laughs> more than no theater, more than ancient Greek plays or woodblock prints. We need to live cooperatively. We need to disrupt the nuclear family ideal and foster intentional community with our neighbors as they did, as they modeled with grace. My father modeled this too, driving them to doctor's appointments in the pre-dawn hours. And my mother models it, feeding Mr. Professor every night for months and years after Mrs. Professor passed. Artie models it, shoveling snow from their sidewalk when they couldn't. And Rebecca models it, hosting gatherings, keeping our 38-year tradition of joint Halloweens alive. Mr. and Mrs. Professor's leadership in the art of being a neighbor is evidenced by so many of you, of us here. They were partners, they were professors, they were my second parents. They were mentors, an aunt, an uncle, curious, knowledgeable, funny, pedantic, committed, commendable, and kind. They were so many things. But in the years to come, as I tell their story, to my son, I will start by simply saying, they were our neighbors. And then I'll sing him our song, because if you ever wanted to play with them, you knew that they'd be there. Good morning. I met Dick Smethurst when I started grad school at Pitt in 1975. I never took a class or studied with him, but he changed my life, and I'm pretty sure that other people think that as well. By the time he got to Pittsburgh, 
Dick had finished college, served in the military in Japan, married Mae Johnson, and just about finished his PhD at Michigan. But he was still trying to figure out what he wanted to say about the military and rural Japan in his thesis when he came to Pitt to interview for a position in the history department. The job talk, as the department calls its trial by fire, went smoothly until the question and answer period. When folks come at you to see how you hold up during pressure. Cy Drescher was renowned for asking the toughest questions. And the question he asked Dick just about knocked him over, exposing a fundamental weakness in his thesis. Dick told me that Cy's question made him realize that Pitt was where he wanted to be, surrounded by smart people, willing to challenge you in a way that made you better at your craft. He recognized he could develop as a person and as an historian, with colleagues forging a camaraderie that extended beyond campus into their homes and families. I think he was more than happy with how that worked out. Dick held his colleagues and students in the highest regard and was deeply loyal to them. And that loyalty was for life. Dick was always interested in how big questions about the economy, politics, conflict, work, penetrated people's daily lives. One of those recurring questions was how Japan found itself at war in the 1930s and 40s. His dissertation, a social basis for pre-war Japanese militarism, the army and the rural community, was the first of three books looking at these questions. It provoked a good deal of controversy among scholars of Japan. He went on to write another book which provoked even more conflict. Dick relished taking on established views, turning them upside down, urging people to reconsider. That second book, Agricultural Development and Tenancy Disputes in Japan, was a deeper dive into the countryside. Dick spent time with former tenant farmers who could talk about their lives, some as far back as the early 1900s. He listened to them and made sure their voices were heard. According to Andrew Hall, one of Dick's former students, he realized that the farmer's recollections didn't jibe with how scholars had depicted them. Rejecting that accepted orthodoxy, Dick explained how the government had bled the peasants through an exploitative land tax, forcing them more deeply into tenancy, debt, and poverty, which eventually caused them to fall prey to the military and the radical right. As you can imagine, his findings upset quite a few scholars, provoking a heated debate in the field. But Dick could handle criticism. He was willing to wrestle with alternative views. I often saw that in the History Department lounge, where people gathered for lunch passionately arguing and passionately laughing with each other. Dick, as Bernie Haggerty remarked, could be mischievous in moments like that. When challenged about his take on history, Dick's response was to look even deeper, to see what he might have missed. His third book, Takahashi Korikeko, Japan, Japan's Canes, From Foot Soldier to Finance Minister, did just that. It's a magisterial biography of a fascinating globetrotter who served as Japan's finance minister seven times and prime minister once. Dick was an elegant writer, and that comes through in Takahashi, which interprets Japanese economics and politics without losing the story of someone whose agenda for Japan was the path not followed. Takahashi, assassinated by rightists in 1936, was largely forgotten until Dick brought him back into the conversation. He showed how Takahashi offered an alternative vision of Japan's future, one sadly not taken. The book's impact extended well beyond academic circles, and Dick was delighted when a government minister began handing out copies of it in an effort to shift economic policy early this century. Perhaps more importantly than the books he wrote was his collaboration to build East Asian studies at Pitt. As Catherine Lindiff explained, Dick was part of a formidable set of historians of East Asia, 
at Pitt who were formative in shaping the Asian Studies Center. Those formidables included May Smethurst, Evelyn Roski, Tom Roski, Keith Brown, Kiko McDonald, Ann Janetta, Tom Reiner, and Catherine Linduff. They secured ongoing federal and corporate funding for research, for students in Japan studies, created an interdisciplinary master's degree, grad programs in several departments, and a superb East Asian collection. Tom Reiner's presence among them must have been a special joy for Dick. They met in the army in Japan where Tom was an enlisted man, Dick an officer. That didn't stop them from fraternizing, and Dick delighted in talking about the time his superior officer reprimanded him for doing just that. Elizabeth Euler was a beneficiary of the program Dick helped create. Dick, she said, was my professor and mentor. I was a very lost 18-year-old when I walked into his classroom in the fall of 1988. Over the course of the semester, he wove a narrative of Japan's past that was complex, sometimes contradictory, that left me full of questions and attempts at answers, which he always encouraged, even as he gently pointed out the way the materials could bring us to different conclusions. I entered college having sworn off studying foreign languages and history, but ended up a medievalist of Japanese studies focused on historical tales. That's all because of the excitement about the Japanese past that Dick instilled. Jim Holmes was also Dick's student. Wherever he did research or spoke at a conference in Japan, Jim found that gave him a certain cachet. Dick and James shared something else. Both could run like the wind. Among Jim's prized possessions is the running singlet that Dick gave him from his track club in Japan. Jim said, I feel very privileged to have studied under Dick, who was not only a great scholar and writer, but so magnanimous, cultured, and sincere. Reed Andrews, who worked along Dick, recalled his lighter side. The department parties in the 1980s, Reed said, had been fairly simple affairs, often potlucks. Dick decided he wanted to up the department game. Meanwhile, May had become chair of the Clastics Department, so they joined forces to give catered parties for the two departments. For one, they hired a string quartet, another a harpist. Reed described Dick as dapper. No question about that undoubtedly the best-dressed male historian in Pittsburgh. <laughs> Granted, there wasn't much competition. <laughs> Marcus Redeker said simply, I'm a, I owe more to Dick Smethurst than I can easily say. I was still teaching at Georgetown after Wendy and I moved the family from D.C. to Pittsburgh in 1988. I was commuting to D.C. and things were hard. At one point, three of the four of us in the family came down with pneumonia. I needed to get a job in Pittsburgh. Dick, who had become department chair, came to the rescue. He helped to create a position I could apply for by lobbying the dean's office. After the department voted to hire me, the dean announced a hiring freeze. Dick called him and threatened to stage a one-man sit-in strike in his office if he did not approve the line. Dick prevailed to the everlasting gratitude of my entire family. 30 years ago, he saved us, and I've been grateful ever since. Dick was a good friend, the very essence of a good and generous colleague. I shall never forget him, nor will I. I knew Dick as a runner before I knew him as an historian or colleague. He was in his early 40s when I joined the grad program, and he was killing it on the trails and looking good doing it. Dick began blazing a trail on the track at Montclair High School in 1951, running the 800 meters in a bit over two minutes, just behind Tom Courtney in a race. Courtney would later win a gold medal in the 800 me meters at the 1956 Olympics. Dick starred for Dickinson College as a miler, but ran a three-hour, 10-minute marathon at the Jersey Shore in 1976 when he was 42. In his 70s, 
he was still lowering his ratio of body fat to muscle. While I wasn't a student of Japan, Dick became my dissertation advisor. I wound up studying sport because he asked me to be his teaching assistant for a course in the history of sport that he and Bob Doherty had developed when enrollments were tanking. Becoming Dick's TA made me realize a few things. I saw how much fun he had teaching sport, how receptive his students were. And I saw especially as he situated sport in Japan's culture, how effective it could be as a way to explore history. I've been trying to do that ever since. In many ways, Dick led a charmed life, almost 63 years with May, part of a department that joyously challenged each other to become better people and better historians. And he stayed in shape till the very end. Quite a life, quite a man. Thank you. So when we, when we originally set up the memorial, there were only going to be two speakers. But we got so many messages from people, especially from Japan, that I felt important to read some of them. So with the help of June, With the help of June, I've been able, she's helped me translate a lot of the messages. And I'm going to apologize right now. My Japanese is not strong. I will do my best to pronounce many of them. But I wanted to make sure that everybody heard the voices of those in Japan that they lived with and that they worked with and that were their colleagues. So please bear with me. I want to start with the Yasuba family. I know June had a chance to work with Rachel in having her letter read, but it's a very extensive family that May and, June, May and Dick lived with. And once again, June has translated for me, so some of the English is my version of it, some of it is June, so uh, I will do my best. For, from June's sister, Yuko. Dear Dick, you are very much like a father to me. Having very talented women close to you, you are always supportive of the rights of women. And you encouraged me in my career as a researcher. For that, I am very grateful. Though I miss you very much, I am, I am very relieved to think that you are in heaven with your beloved May. From June's mother, Sashiko, our long and warm friendship between the Smethursts and the Isubas started when I was asked to help Dick learn Japanese in 1958. Thank you for the wonderful memories of our family's lives together. I will miss you so, both Dick and May. From June's uncle, Yasuaki. Dear Dick, we miss you very much. I believe May has welcomed you again wholeheartedly. Your one year stay in our house in Sendagaya with May started with difficulty but ended very happily. During your stay with us, our family's English was not improved at all, as our father ordered our whole family to speak only Japanese, which helped me a lot. <laughs> Instead, you showed us gracefully, sometimes restrainedly, modest American spirit, which influenced us tremendously to change our image of America after the war, which I find absolutely amazing to hear. Our grandchildren still call you May and Dick, our grandparents in the United States. May Dick rest in peace. From June's aunt Mariko, 62 years ago, two foreigners came to our house in Sendagaya. They were Mr. and Mrs. Smethers, friends of my eldest brother, Yasukichi Yasuba. They got to know each other while Yasukichi was studying at Johns Hopkins on a Fulbright scholarship. Dick and May lived in our house for a year. At the beginning, I was afraid. My English was very poor. But since they spoke Japanese, it made my life much easier. You joined our family. We began our unusual life together. After you and May went back to the United States, our life became very vacant. 
You are a great man with a warm heart, humble and supremely kind person. It was wonderful to learn that you and May were a perfect match. You and May were treasures that my parents had left for us. Years later, I was so moved to know that you and May had kept visiting my parents' grave in the suburb of Tokyo. They used the train without informing the family every time. Every, every time they visited Japan, they visited the cemetery. It was great to see you both. As you last during your last visit six years ago, I did not feel well, but you did not, but did not want to miss seeing you. Later, May returned to heaven, and now Dick is there too. With Dick's return, one great era of the Suba family came to an end. We will miss you very much. From June's Aunt Yoshiko. I had hoped to see you again, but alas, I was not able. I hope you are now with May, enjoying your reunion with her. Have you already seen your old friend Yasukichi, my brother-in-law? I imagine the Yusuba parents, their sons, and one of their daughters, Mihiko, Mihokyo, are there to welcome you back to the Yasuba family, just as you spent your young days with them. May and you had a very long relationship with the Yasuba family, dating back to when you lived with us. I first met you much later after my father had died and just before I married. Since then, we met every year. When you came to Japan, we all gathered at my mother-in-law's house. Thank you for visiting the Yasuba Family Cemetery in Kadaira so often. In recent years, during your visit to Japan, May, my sister-in-law Mariko, and I went shopping, and Dick always joined our shopping trips and listened to our chatter with great interest. He was a very patient man. I thought of you two as an ideal model of what a husband and wife should be. I had not had a chance to visit Pittsburgh to fight, despite your frequent invitation. And after May's illness, my first visit finally came. I came accompanied with my two nieces, June and you, very happy to see May on the beautiful fall days in Pittsburgh. Although you were in the midst of a very difficult time, you still made us feel comfortable and happy. It is just, I called them dick-like efforts to make us feel comfortable, and we appreciate that so much. During our long relationship, you have always been sincere, humble, and above all, your gentle, casual, kind self. We always want to emulate you. With heartfelt respect and gratitude, I wish a peaceful rest in the presence of God and with May. Until we meet again, Yoshi. You can see the tight bond between the Yusuba family and the Smethurst. It was amazing, the messages we got. I actually want to transition a little. Obviously, May and Dick spent an extraordinary amount of their life in Japan, studying it, living there, becoming a part of it. Every time we went to their house, it was just a part of our visit. Japan was very central to who they were. And I just picked out two or three messages from some of his colleagues that Dick worked with there. The first one I found particularly impactful, and Rob, you spoke of Takahashi Koekiyo. His grandson wrote a letter. So, from Yasu Inoue, grandson of Takahashi. My relationship with Professor Smethurst was brief and only a fraction of his long years in life. We met in 2008 when he came to Japan to promote his book, From Foot Soldier to Finance Mr. Minister, Takahashi Korakiyo, Japan's Canes. And then until October of 23, when we f exchanged final emails on the occasion of his 90th birthday. I wrote him then, due to recurring cancer, I should not expect to reach your age. Are you ready to live to be 100? Yasu. To which Dick replied, I don't know if I can do 10 more years or even 10 more days or weeks, but I am trying. P.S. I miss May son very much. And I talk to her every day from Dick. I'm sure he is talking to May son every day now. 
As one of the youngest grandsons of Takahashi, I had a privilege of hearing interesting anecdotes from parents and relatives directly who had known Karikiyo in person, albeit not so much as public figure, but as private family man. As I grew older, I took interest in knowing more about the specific roles he played in the trajectory of Japan toward World War II, randomly searching books related to the topic. I was not happy with many of the negative conclusions that some of the critics put forth. It is in this backdrop that Mr. Koronobu Takahashi kindly introduced me to Richard Smethurst's book. I immediately got a copy and devoured it. I was thrilled to find that the book concluded that Takahashi's death removed Japan's last resistance to pre-war militarism, a view not commonly seen in Japan. Once again, as Rob pointed out, Dick was always questioning and putting forth interesting ideas on what truth could be. The following year in 2008, Professor Smethurst himself visited Japan and gave a talk at the International House in Roppongi. I had the pleasure of meeting him in person for the first time. I did not expect our relationship would last so long and would be so full of fond memories and warm feelings. Every year, Professor Smethurst would visit Japan with his wife, May, and it was a privilege to meet him and discuss interesting topics. I was a remote student from Japan without having to pay Pittsburgh tuition, trying to catch up in stringent academic course from the university. Thanks to his training, I was able to study objectively the modern history of Japan. The more I came to know him, the more I became convinced that the fond memory of him and his wife was shared by all and every person who came into contact with them, as it was an effect of a truly fine character of theirs. I cannot express my deep appreciation and gratitude enough for the friendship. I believe Professor Smethurst was a true-born teacher, as was Takahashi. May his soul rest with May in eternal peace, your friend and student, Yasu. Professor Toshihiko Itaya, I was very surprised to receive an email informing me that me my mentor, Professor Smethurst, had passed away. I will never forget the many blessings I received from him. When I published my first book, Russo-Japanese War, The Battle for Financing, the first economist to contact me was not a Japanese economist or professor, but Professor Smethurst from the University of Pittsburgh. Since I had been very much impressed with his book about Takahashi, and had referred to it a great deal, it was an unexpected joy for me to have him reach out. I met him when he came to Japan. He took me to several study groups and introduced me to many important scholars. I called him my mentor throughout our lives. His beloved wife, May, passed away a few years ago, and the most accurate way to describe his depression would be, I cannot stand to watch it. I asked a friend, Mr. Kaguchi, to, an illustrator, to, to draw a portrait for him for a weekly economist magazine focused on Karakio, and he was extremely pleased and very good about doing the posing. <laughs> I pray for his soul, rest in peace, and thank him for the many benefits he has bestowed upon us. I received over 30 messages, and I only extracted about a third of them. It was amazing, the outpouring of respect and love. And there's probably three things I pulled out. One, his love of Japan was very deep. Two, his love of family, both in Pittsburgh and the Yusuba family, was extraordinarily strong. And you could see it throughout the messages. But then three, the love between May and Dick was amazing. May was everywhere. They were together everywhere. And it just sang through every single message. So we will miss, miss them both. Let us rise. I am resurrection, and I am life, says the Lord. Whoever has faith in me shall have life even though he die. And everyone who has life 
and has committed himself to me in faith shall not die forever. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives and that at the last he will stand upon the earth. After my awaking, he will raise me up and in my body I shall see God. I myself shall see and my eyes behold him who is my friend and not a stranger. For none of us has life in himself, and none becomes his own master when he dies. For if we have life, we are alive in the Lord, and if we die, we die in the Lord. So then, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's possession. Happy from now on are those who die in the Lord. So it is, says the Spirit, for they rest from their labors. The Lord be with you. you. Let us pray. O God of grace and glory, we remember before you this day our brother Dick. We thank you for giving him to us, his family and friends to know and to love as a companion on our earthly pilgrimage. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us faith to see in death the gate of eternal life so that in quiet confidence we may continue our course on earth until by your call we are reunited with those who have gone before. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Most merciful God, whose wisdom is beyond our understanding, deal graciously with all who love Dick in their grief. Surround them with your love, that they may not be overwhelmed by their loss, but have confidence in your goodness and strength to meet the days to come. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. A reading from Genesis. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he, departed, when he departed from Haram. Abram took his wife Sarai and his brother's son Lot and all the possessions that they had gathered and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran. And they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Please join with me in the reading of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. A reading from Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who died. For since death came through a human being, 
the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? What kind of body do they come? Fool, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And as for what you sow, you do not sow the body that is to be, but a bare seed, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind a seed of its own body. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a physical body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. For this perishable body must put on imperishability, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When this perishable body puts on imperishability, and this moral bo mortal body puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will be fulfilled. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. The word of the Lord. Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. 
In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice from heaven said, you are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord. Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Today's gospel reading comes from Mark's story about Jesus, which Christians usually read at the beginning of Advent. Advent is the sort of happy new year of the church season, starting about four Sundays before the welcoming of Jesus' birth at the Christmas celebration. Some, think of, some people think of Advent as a season of waiting, but I disagree. Because I believe that Advent is a season of disruptions, interruptions. Mark is the most breathless and brief of any version of Jesus' story that we have. The first words of Mark's story are the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. On your mark, get set, go! The most frequently appearing word in Mark's gospel, a detail which Dick did love and told me so, is this Greek word, euthus, which means immediately. Immediately Jesus did this. Immediately he did that. Immediately he walked this way for this reason. And the way that Mark sets this race in motion, he begins with a man named John, otherwise known as the baptizer, shouting, there is a voice crying in the wilderness. John's purpose his whole goal in life is to point, to tell us where to look because the action happened so quickly that we might miss the most interesting parts. And so Mark uses John's long bony finger and his loud shouting voice to lift our faces toward the energetic story of Jesus' life and death and resurrection and then consider what on earth it has to do with us. A story so urgent that Mark does not even begin with the story of Jesus' birth. He skips over Christmas entirely. In Mark's telling, there's no shepherds in the field, there's no wise men from the east, there's no Mary glowing in a stable by the manger, there's no angels filling the, song, the, the skies with their songs. Instead, Mark begins with a baptizer, this wild man who wears camel skins and eats bugs dipped in honey who starts by shouting about how the way for any heart to prepare for God in this world is to use another fun Greek word that Dick and I discussed, repent. Now the word repent, as I'm sure you immediately just had a knee-jerk reaction and lurch in your stomach, is often used very poorly and colloquially as more or less a means to berate people away from some sort of bad behavior. However, repent in its original Greek use simply means to turn around. Stop. Stop what you're doing. Pivot and go a different way. Try a different direction. And John says that Jesus' arrival means that everything gets disrupted, interrupted immediately. The world is shifted and changed, and it's time for a new direction. And in that way, Dick Smethurst himself becomes a picture of John himself painted from that story. In the beginning, as Mark starts the story, Dick began his life immediately. I loved to run before my legs went bad, he told me. He would say when we visited, he remembered his running days and he missed moving quickly. 
If his parents were with us today, it would hardly be a surprise if they would tell us that Dick could run before he crawled. <laughs> Dick's curiosity, his imagination, his wide-ranging intellectual capacity frequently had his mind moving even more quickly than his legs could carry him. Immediately, he fell in love with history. Immediately, he met May in the, in the classics department. Immediately, he loved her. Immediately, they raced to the altar to get married. And suddenly, their romance was interrupted by Dick's appointment to the US Army and intelligence. And to their surprise, they were turned, repentant, so to speak, into, into the direction of Japan where their love was ever prospered by a deep and developed affection that God gave them. A new land to together love and cherish and explore as much as they did one another in marriage. How much is that like a first story that we heard about Abraham, often better known as Abraham, who on a cool night heard God's voice disrupt his evening walk saying, you, Go, I'll give you land, I'll give you children, and I will bless you to bless others. So indeed, God sent Dick on a race together with May to a new land. While together, they openly spoke to the second part of that blessing. They spoke to the sorrow and suffering of their inability to have a much desired family. And yet, they built an extraordinary extended family of nephews, nieces, students, colleagues, friends, children, faithful church members, all their own. And in that way, the lands they came to know as citizen, friend, and neighbor, they blessed this whole wide world together indeed as blessing. They went immediately receiving, disrupting, interrupting plans with grace and stamina as the days gave opportunity and boy, does everyone at Redeemer know what that looked like. They were first in line to volunteer. They were first in line to speak up. They were first in line to make sure that we could sing and speak and enjoy time together because there was nothing more that they delighted in was than for neighbors to become family together. Yet for all the ways that Dick unexpectedly went about his own life's race, what marks him as so unique are the ways that like John the Baptist, he pointed with endless, piercing attention to all things and all others outside of himself in God's great wide world. When I experienced the gift of a first visit at his home, Dick carefully gave me a tour of the artwork all along their walls. He took long time to explain where he and May had acquired various pieces of art in Japan who he was with and why it might be notable and impactful for any American in Pittsburgh to see, observe, and understand such a thing. He showed black prints of theater and then went to the coffee table where he said, sit, sit, I'll get some coffee. And then he wanted to showcase books that he and May had researched and sometimes even written together. Though not to show off but rather to invite in and to point with urgency toward the gifts of life that he himself had witnessed for all of these years that he lived. Dick carefully explained that in the wake of World War II, far too many people had dismissed the Japanese people, their culture, their history, their art, when one simply needed to look up and actually notice the pearls of fascination that they might have otherwise missed. Thank God for Japan. Thank God for the Japanese. Don't miss out. Dick pointed to the great goodness of this land and this culture that became his own by passionate, careful study and investment. Then Dick pointed to May during that meeting, who at this point had already been cremated and was in a blue urn just across the place where he liked best to sit. Let me tell you about my wife. And as he did, it was as if May was sitting there next to me herself. Because you could not start a sentence with Dick and not end it with May. You could not start a sentence with May without ending it with Dick. Dick came to life when talking about his May, and she was never far from his first thought or final word. 
And in this way, in these ways, in this capacity, what an unusual man. So profoundly selfless as he breathlessly took anyone that he met and fixed all of our eyes to this world full of fascination in which he so deeply valued the lives of others. In a time when post-war Japan remained hardly popular, when vigorously supporting a wife, a woman, in her academic career because he deeply believed that her intellect was up to the challenge of any man. When acquiring a panoply of languages, some contemporary and others since fallen by the way. When greeting familiar and foreign guests. Dick Smethurst in his life became a variation in the key of all God's good promises. Eager, immediate, and disruptive in the best ways when introducing new ways to know good things about God's living and active world. And so in these ways, Dick's death is in fact a surprising advent for us today. Even as we enter into the heat of summer in June, hardly weeks away from Christmas, yet Dick's death orients our face and our heart and our hope toward the promise of life on which he staked his own. As Jesus began to run his own race, we find him in that gospel story from Mark at the very beginning. Over at the River Jordan, as he was repented and redirected and reoriented by God, as John pushes him under the water's flow, and immediately when Jesus emerged from those waters, he saw the heavens tore open, and he heard God's voice announce, you are my son, the beloved, and with you I am well pleased. And from there, Jesus immediately started to run his race, trusting that God was indeed with and for him. And John, John's job was to keep pointing. To keep pointing, even for us today, to say, see, look at this one. Look at this man of God. Look at God's own son. Look where he looks. See what he sees. Love who he loves. Love what he loves. And what does God love? And who does God love? I think John the Baptist and Dick would agree. It's you. You are the one that God loves. Right along with the rest of this world that God created from the very beginning. Jesus was baptized by John so we would get to over here, God announced that God is with him and for him, leading him and us to a life of faith marked by confident faith in the face of disruption, which of course is hardly any different for Dick. Dick's life was baptized towards repentance, which means he was pointed fearlessly toward the unexpected, giving him the gift of immediately turning toward this unfettered life, which is God's holy gift meant for you too. Dick understood the word repent was never meant to be a stick, but rather meant as an invitation toward goodness in the wide world. It means turn back or turn around or run a surprising way. So if you're carrying a heavy load, <coughs> turn around, set it down and rest here. Or if you're unbearably light, turn around and see what your neighbor needs because your attention is probably needed there. If you're feeling idle and slow, turn around and take up a labor of love. If you're frantic and feeling furious, repent and find peace. If you've fallen down, repent, rise and shine because your light has come. If you're closed up tight, repent so you may be cracked open. And if you're too spread or too scattered, repent and settle into the bread and the cup that is up here at this altar because it is given and shed for you. If you're frightened, repent. Take heart and be of good courage. If you're feeling cocky and arrogant today, repent, because you'll probably find rest in the goodness of humility. If you laugh, repent. Let your laughter resolve into sighs at this funeral to help others grieve. And if you weep, repent so that as you weep, because tears are welcome at a funeral, do so though as not one who grieves without hope. 
And in our grieving and remembering today, know that God holds your every tear. God holds your every memory. Then all of us may turn together, even as Dick and May do from their graves today, to face Paul's words as Paul provocatively asks. Paul, again, as Dick and I discussed the finer points of Greek language, there are points in scripture which likes to use the, the language of sarcasm. Sarcasm, of course, being Greek, using sarx, which means flesh, and asm, which means to tear. So when you are being sarcastic, you're tearing a little at the flesh. And this is exactly Paul's use of the language today, saying death has been swallowed up in victory, so where of death is your victory? Where of death is your sting? The sting of death is everything that keeps us from facing our neighbors with curiosity, kindness, hope, and delight. And the sting of death is the power which keeps us staring in only at ourselves. But thanks be to God, not only for God, but for the likes of Dick and May, who give us examples of what it looks like to repent and turn audaciously toward this great big life that we've been given and the neighbors that we've been given by our God, by faith. So let us gather today to continue to look where Dick had his eyes ever looking and with his fingers ever pointing toward the surprising places of life around and beyond himself. And in that, Lord, keep us steadfast in such radical hope too. As we place Dick and May in their final resting place today, we will also repeat the beautifully sarcastic words of the Contachion, which of course sounds very formal and very religious, but let's be clear, we're mocking death in the face of the life that Dick and May led, saying, God, you only are immortal, the creator and maker of mankind, and we are mortal formed of the earth, and to earth we shall turn. So for did you ordain me when you created me, saying, you are dust, and to dust you shall return, and therefore all of us go down to the dust, and even at the grave we make our sarcastic song, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Take that death, because we have life. In other words, even in the still of death, we trust that Dick is still energetically running towards life, even right here. Even in death, Dick joins together with May, with Abraham, with John, and with St. Paul saying, go, turn this way and that, turn immediately toward your neighbor, turn toward the foreign and make it your own. Turn fearlessly toward the love of God, which affirms that through Christ Jesus, the dead are raised and that indeed the last enemy to be destroyed is death and death never gets the last word. By faith, Trust in the love that Dick, that, Dick lived, that, Dick, that Dick lived and that Dick will continue to live now and in the life of the world to come. Together with his men, with everyone who has gone before you to get back to the business of life, which always and ever urges us on to the surprising life that God has created for you now and in the life of the world to come. And that indeed is the beginning of the good news. So thanks be to God today for Dick Smethurst, who showed us that way. Amen. Please rise and join with me in, using, in confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. <coughs> I believe in God, the Father and the Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and was seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Yeah. 
The prayers of the people can be found on page eight of your program. For our brother Dick, let us pray to our Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am resurrection and I am life. Lord, you consoled Martha and Mary in their distress. Draw near to us who mourn for Dick and dry the tears of those who weep. You wept at the grave of Lazarus, your friend. Comfort us in our sorrow. You raise the dead to life. Give to our brother eternal life. You promise paradise to the thief who repented. Bring our brother to the joys of heaven. Hear us, Lord. Our brother was washed in baptism and anointed with the Holy Spirit. Give him fellowship with all your saints. Hear us, Lord. He was nourished with your body and blood. Grant him a place at the table in your heavenly kingdom. Hear us, Lord. Comfort us in our sorrows at the death of our brother. Let our faith be our consolation and eternal life our hope. Lord Jesus Christ, we commend to you our brother Dick, who is reborn by water and the spirit in holy baptism. Grant that his death may recall to us your victory over death and be an occasion for us to renew our trust in your father's love. Give us, we pray, the faith to follow where you have led the way and where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit to the ages of ages. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us share the peace. First, I would like to welcome all of you here with us to the funeral of Dick Smethurst and to the interment of both Dick and May Smethurst. I am especially appreciative today for Reuben because I don't think there's anything better than a little person preaching through most of a funeral service. <laughs> so thanks be to God for this kind of goodness in life. We want to share the peace with everyone who is worshiping and gathered together with us online. So if we can turn and face the camera and wave to all of those there at the top of the screen back there, peace be with you as well. Just a few brief instructions before we enter into our service of Holy Communion. At the conclusion of our Holy Communion service, for which there will be more instructions just in a little bit, uh, I will, we will say the post-communion prayer, and then I will come down with our crucifer and we will give a final commendation for Dick. We did so with May at her funeral just some time ago. And then at the beginning of the exit hymn, first the cross will go, and then Dick and Andy, or sorry, Kurt and Andy are going to carry both of the urns out, and behind them you are invited to go down and out. You're going to go out and to the left and out into the courtyard of the columbarium where we will inter them. So please follow the two urns. Behind them, we will go uh, with our worship team, and then I will come and meet you out there where we will continue on with our service. You may feel free to leave whatever it is that you would like here in the pews. We are generally a very safe place. However, I would ask that you bring your funeral bulletins with you because there are calls and responses throughout. 
If you need a separate way to get there a little bit more safely, please make sure that our ushers know and they will help you get out as well. And directly following the interment, there is going to be a luncheon in our parish hall. Our parish hall is directly through these doors. You take a left and then there will be another right and you really can't miss it. And so please join us as we celebrate and have a time of remembrance. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. Let us rise.
It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks and praise to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who rose victorious from the dead and comforts us with the blessed hope of everlasting life. For to your people, O Lord, life is changed, not ended. And when our mortal body lies in death, there is prepared for us a dwelling place eternal in the heavens. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the whole company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as oft as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this cup. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and the blood of the new covenant. Unite us with your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified in the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country, where with Abraham and Sarah, Paul, May, and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters, through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now let us pray as our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us.
gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and receive them in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. and are baptized are welcomed at this the Lord's table. If you do not believe you are not yet baptized or if for any reason you cannot receive from this the Lord's table, please come forward for a blessing because this is our Lord's table and everyone is welcomed here. There will be one station up here at the altar. There will be another down by the pulpit. Please come forward to whichever one feels most comfortable and accessible for you. And if you need any help, please alert our usher and we will deliver the communion to you at your seat.
Almighty God, we thank you that in your great love you have fed us with the spiritual food and drink of the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, and have given us a foretaste of your heavenly banquet. Grant that this sacrament may be to us a comfort in affliction and a pledge of our inheritance in that kingdom where there is no death, neither sorrow nor crying, but the fullness of joy with all your saints through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Amen. Give rest, O Christ, to your servants with your saints. You only are immortal, the creator and maker of mankind, and we are mortal, formed of the earth, and to earth we shall return. For so did you ordain when you created me, saying, You are dust, and to dust you shall return. All of us go down to the dust. Yet even at the grave we make our song. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Give rest, O Christ, to your servants with your saints, where sorrow and pain are no more, neither sign but life everlasting. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant Dick. Acknowledge we humbly beseech you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy and into the blessed rest of everlasting peace and into the glorious company of all the saints in light. Amen. <laughs>
get down. We turn to page 18 of the bulletins. <coughs> Christ is risen from the dead, trampling, trampling down, down death by death, death and, and giving life to those in the tomb. tomb. The Son of Righteousness is gloriously risen, risen giving, giving light to those who sat in darkness and in the shadow of death. death. The Lord will guide our feet into the way of peace, having taken away the sin of the world. Christ will open the kingdom of heaven to all who believe in his name, saying, Come, O blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. Into paradise may the angels lead you. At your coming may the martyrs receive you and bring you into the holy city, Jerusalem. You will show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. If you are interested in Abel, you may join me in the Hebrew Kaddish, which we will follow with the English translation. Amen. Amen. Ose shalom vim romav, hu ya se shalom aleno val kol en mitriel, amim vru di amen. Please join me in the English translation. Magnified and sanctified is the great name of God throughout the world, which was created according to divine will. May the rule of peace be established speedily in our time unto us and unto the entire household of Israel. And let us say, Amen. May God's great name be praised throughout all eternity, glorified and celebrated, lauded and praised, acclaimed and honored, extolled and exalted, ever be the name of thy Holy One, far beyond all song and psalm, beyond all hymns of glory which mortals can offer, and let us say, Amen. May there be abundant peace from heaven with life's goodness for us and for all thy people Israel. And let us say, Amen. May the one who brings peace to the universe bring peace to us and to all the people Israel. And let us say, Amen. O God, whose blessed Son was laid in a sepulcher in the garden, bless, we pray, this columbarium and grant that our brother and sister whose bodies are buried here may dwell with Christ in paradise and may come to your heavenly kingdom through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Grant, O oh Lord, that all who are bereaved the spirit of faith and courage, that they may have strength to meet the days to come with steadfastness and patience, not sorrowing as those without hope, but in thankful remembrance of your great goodness and in the joyful expectation of eternal life with those they love. And this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Ensure in certain hope of resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ, we commend to Almighty God our sister May, and we commend her body to this place, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. The Lord bless her and keep her. The Lord make his face shine upon her and be gracious to her. The Lord lift upon his countenance upon her and give her peace. Amen. In the 
sure and certain hope of resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ, we commend to Almighty God our brother Dick, and we commit his body to this place, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. The Lord bless him and keep him. The Lord make his face shine upon him and be gracious to him. The Lord lift up his countenance upon him and give him peace. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Rest eternal, grant to them, O Lord, and let perpetual shine. May their souls and the souls of all the departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God. The God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. I will meet you all in the parish hall. <laughs>